we work with a mission of nourishing healthy lives globally backed by the vision of quantum leap for sustainable growth and striving for excellence and values to fostering corporate culture with enhancement of creativity and integrity hexagon nutrition has been providing reliable services to the customers with continuous innovation and solutions we have always been front runners in providing solutions to varied segments of nutrition like clinical nutrition wellness nutrition micronutrient premixes and therapeutic foods having presence in over 72 countries we make in India and market across the world hexagon nutrition has received multiple awards and recognitions namely Export Excellence Award by Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India, the Best Healthcare Brand 2016 by the Economic Times, Clinical Nutrition Brand of the Year 2016 by CIMS. Quality is our commitment, and to deliver on this commitment, we have set up state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities at three different locations. Nashik. This facility is spread over an area of 5.5 hectares with total buildup area of 45,000 square feet. Chennai. This facility has allowed us to cater to the ever-growing demand of the international market. Tutikorin. Ultra-modern facility spread across 20,000 square feet. Hexagon Nutrition follows strict guidelines and policies to ensure superior quality and accuracy at each step of the value chain, starting right from the procurement of raw materials till the production of finished goods. We begin with supplier audits. Stringent quality inspection and audits of suppliers is done before approving the supplier for the raw materials. Global sourcing of raw materials. Best quality raw materials are procured. Testing of these raw materials is done as per norms and certifications. International audits. Quality check audits are conducted at our facilities by UNICEF and UNWFP as we are authorized suppliers to these NGOs, World Vision, USA and World Food Program. Manufacturing practices. We conduct frequent checks of our manufacturing machineries and equipments for microbial contamination and air quality through various methods like air sampling, blender swabs, epoxy flooring, etc. Packaging. We use extra protective foil for primary packaging, and nitrogen blanketing technique helps to preserve and protect the goodness of the product throughout its shelf life. And the final check is conducted for sensory evaluation. Every batch manufactured at our facility is passed through sensory evaluation. This is done to check the taste and consistency of the final product. Hexagon Nutrition has also emerged as a leader in providing unmatched food fortification solutions to domestic and international markets, catering to industries like bakery, staples, dairy, FMCG, beverages, edible oil, and everyday cereals and nutrition drink supplements. We take pride in serving the bottom of the pyramid through innovative solutions like ready-to-use therapeutic and supplementary food. These products specially cater to severe to moderately acute malnutrition patients through community-based therapeutic care programs serving the several international markets. Welcome to our NutriCafe, an ultra-modern experience center in our Chennai plant, where you will be served delicious fortified foods like fortified bread, rejuvenating beverages, nurtured edible oil, etc. The NutriCafe allows us to test and develop new concepts and ultimately helps us to provide best-in-class products to the customers. Hexagon Nutrition is committed to integrating environmental, social, and ethical principles into the core business. Through our CSR activities, we seek to touch and transform people's lives by promoting healthcare and nutrition. Clinical Nutrition Excellence Academy, bridging the gap between theory and practice. An initiative of Hexagon Nutrition, the CNEA platform has engaged speakers of local and global recognition, covering wide range of topics from critical care, cancer, surgery, etc. The Academy truly strives towards knowledge sharing, concept development, and looks forward to launch certificate courses. Hexagon Nutrition, making a positive difference in the global arena of nutrition. Your nutrition partner.
Imagine a world where no one goes to bed hungry, where every mother gives birth to a healthy child, physically and mentally, and every human is so well nourished that they are able to live a full and active life at any age. It does seem like a distant dream when over 800 million people don't have access to enough quantity of food and two out of every five adults don't have access to the right quality of food. We have been fighting to combat malnutrition in every way possible, but it's a problem that persists. Malnutrition doesn't discriminate against geographies, age groups, economic strata or gender which makes it even more important to fight at this level than later. Take these two children, for example. The differences may not always be visible, but Annika can perform better at school, while Jambulani is struggling. Annika has better cognitive health and immunity, allowing her to excel in school every day, while Jambulani is constantly low on energy and often falls ill. This is because Annika is getting well-balanced meals and is properly nourished, whereas Jambulani isn't getting the right nutrients and food groups. There are so many reasons behind malnutrition, inappropriate dietary choices, low incomes and difficulty obtaining the right foods. When someone is deprived of the right balance of nutrients, either through too little food or a limited diet, there can be a severe impact on their health. It's more the quality of the food than the quantity. According to UNICEF, out of 149 million children under the age of five, 49 million are stunted and 40 million are overweight. The amount of attention being paid to adolescents as a nutritionally vulnerable group with unique nutritional needs in the life cycle is growing, but they are still frequently overlooked. Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General, once said that nutrition is one of the best drivers of development. Without significant progress to end malnutrition, countries will simply not be able to attain the sustainable development goals set out to transform our world by 2030. But how does this change happen? That's where all of us come in. Fortification is one of the best ways to ensure that the right nutrients are reaching the right people. Fortification is the process of adding micronutrients to food, which aims to reduce the number of people affected by malnutrition. For almost 10 centuries, flour has been part of our regular diets in all its various forms. But during the milling process, the nutrients present in the grains decrease considerably. There is a distinctive difference in the micronutrients present in harvested wheat and flour. And to restore these lost nutrients, the flour needs to be fortified with micronutrients like folic acid, vitamin B12 and iron. After this fortification process, the flour can then go on to be used to produce several food items like bread, pasta, noodles, cake and so much more. By mandating fortification of staples, governments have played an important role in ensuring nutrition for entire populations. Since 1991, we at Hexagon Nutrition have dedicated ourselves to offering innovative solutions, tackling the major issue of malnutrition prevalent across the globe. We provide reliable and unmatched services and continue to work to find new solutions to the growing demand for holistic nutrition. Our premix focuses on the need to fortify staple foods with the right blend of micronutrients to meet the needs of the masses. Our flagship clinical nutrition brand, Pentasure, helps in nutritional support for both chronic and acute conditions. Through a collaboration with Sprinkle's Global Health Initiative of Canada, we try to enhance the lives of children in many underdeveloped and developing countries where iron deficiency, anemia and malnutrition is prevalent. At Hexagon Nutrition, we also manufacture ready-to-use supplementary food 
and ready to use therapeutic food for cases of severe and moderate acute malnutrition. We go back to an era when the vitamin supply was monopolized, leaving very little choice to the customers to have an alternate dependable supplier of fortificants. The need was thus identified and Hexagon Nutrition was started three decades ago with the intent of serving a large number of people and fulfilling a need of the industry. Starting with the vitamin premix business, Hexagon has diversified over the years into clinical nutrition products targeted towards the disease specific segments, therapeutic foods for the severely malnourished and now food testing as well. Hexagon is not merely a premix provider but also a technical facilitator when it comes to fortification. Our ability to supply the right fortificants and our competency to test the fortified products is what makes us a unique partner. Hexagon would continue to build responsive relationships with our partners by providing innovative and value-added products and service. Going forward, we would expand and leverage on our global manufacturing capabilities to provide a one-stop solution for all nutritional requirements. The commitment is from our team of people who are both committed and competent. We live by the dream that the product we make is improving people's lives and I personally find my purpose of life in that. Nothing is more satisfying than seeing our future generations healthy and happy. A well-nourished world where everybody is able to live a full and active life at any age doesn't have to be a distant dream. Together, let's make this a reality. What is nutrition? According to WHO, nutrition is the intake of food considered in relation to the body's dietary needs. It is important for all living organisms to meet the optimum nutritional needs. Food comprises of nutrients that help fulfill the nutritional demand of people. Nutrients can be classified in five broad categories, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins and minerals. Carbohydrates, proteins and fats are macronutrients that are required in large quantities by the human body. Macronutrients are essential for the following functions. Energy, bodybuilding, formation of human tissues and organs. Vitamins and minerals are micronutrients that are required in very small quantities by the human body. Though the roles played by them have a major impact, micronutrients play various roles that help in supporting metabolism, immunity, bone health, cardiac health. When the daily needs of micronutrients are not met, it leads to various deficiency diseases. Developing countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America are witness to such conditions. Folic acid deficiency among pregnant women causes neural tube defects among infants. Iodine deficiency causes unusual enlargement of thyroid glands, also known as goiter. Calcium and vitamin D deficiencies causes bone-related issues, such as osteomalacia among toddlers and osteoporosis among adults. Vitamin A deficiency causes eye-related defects, such as night blindness. Iron deficiency, anemia, is one of the most common micronutrient deficiencies among adolescent girls and women. Vitamin C deficiency causes gum-related problems, known as scurvy. Processing of food renders most innate micronutrients ineffective. This is due to the harsh conditions such as heat, pH and light that impact Hello. the levels of vitamins during the process. Hello, Hence, there arises a need to replenish the lost micronutrients back to its source. Micronutrient fortification is an excellent tool to restore the lost nutrients. According to industry experts, it is employed in a lot of countries where the rate of micronutrient deficiency is high. Fortification is a process we'll of enriching food products with vitamins minutes. and minerals in order to help people meet their nutritional requirements. Micronutrient premixes are convenient yet powerful solutions to help curb the incidence of deficiency diseases.
Premix is a blend that contains the optimum levels of vitamins and minerals that go into the intended food products. Mostly staples such as wheat flour, edible vegetable oil, salt, milk and rice are chosen for fortification as they not only serve as efficient vehicles for carrying the micronutrients but also given the fact that the majority of the population consume these products. Various governments have mandated fortification of different staple food in order to tackle deficiencies. Examples of countries: Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Nigeria, Uzbekistan, the Philippines, Indonesia and Saudi Arabia to name a few. Even India is considering fortification as a gateway to a healthier future. Hexagon Nutrition is a pioneer in the field of nutrition for the last 25 years. We aim to make the world a healthier place by taking a step towards eradicating global malnutrition. We work with FMCG companies, NGOs, and governments across the world to promote healthy living. Hexagon Nutrition has three broad product lines: clinical nutrition. Hexagon offers a wide range of clinical and wellness nutrition products that are targeted towards different ailments such as renal health, weight management, geriatric health, etc. Therapeutic Nutrition. Our therapeutic range of products helps reduce the degree of severe malnourishment among children. Our products are very dense in energy, protein, and fat. Customized micronutrient premixes. We work with multiple NGOs, governments, and FMCG companies, offering our micronutrient blends that are employed across an array of food applications, such as rice, flour, beverages, dairy. Oils and fats and noodles. Mute. Vivek, sir, you are on mute. <laughs> Is it fine? Can you hear me? Yeah. Vivek, sir, you are on mute. Vivek Chandra ji. Anu, can you please help Mr. Vivek Chandra? Yes, are you able to hear me now? Yes, yes, please go ahead, sir. Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Vivek Chandra, CEO, LT Foods Global Branded Business, and uh, the co-chair of the National Food Processing Council of ASOCHEM. And it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you, the attendees and the participants, to ASOCHEM's webinar on food fortification. a sustainable solution to fight hidden hunger in a globalized world let me begin by welcoming our esteemed speakers for today's webinar mr sachin jaiswal joint secretary department of agriculture government of nagaland dr devansh yadav deputy commissioner food and civil supplies government of arunachal pradesh mr tapan kumar das additional director Food, Civil Supplies and Consumer Affairs, Government of Tripura. Ms. Inoshi Sharma, Director, FFRC, F FSSAI, Government of India. Mr. Vikram Kelkar, MD, Hexagon Nutrition. Mr. Arun Om Lal, Senior Vice President, Hexagon Nutrition. Ms. Deepthi Gulati, Head of Program, Gain. Mr. Vivek Arora. Senior Advisor, Tata Trust, Ms. Sharika Yunus, Head of Unit and Programs Officer for Health and Nutrition, World Food Program, United Nations, Mr. Durga Prasad, Head Quality Control, Pristine Kalinga, Ms. Megha Mankev, Hexagon Nutrition, and Ms. Nirupma Sharma, Head Agriculture, Food Processing and FMCG Division. of aso cham and one who's pulled this whole thing together welcome to all of you and all the other participants 
The focus of today's deliberation is on adopting food fortification as an effective strategy of combating malnutrition and undernutrition, and to discuss the challenges on its faster and fuller adoption, particularly in the aspirational districts, and particularly so in the Northeast. Let me start with a few comments, please. That the problem of malnutrition is severe has been oft stated and oft stressed. Good nutrition is critical for the functioning of human immune system and protection against disease and for proper growth and development of children. It has been reported that undernutrition contributes annually to about 45% of preventable deaths of young children. Impact of malnutrition in causing 2 to 3% loss of GDP has been well recorded. It is also established that the current food plate cannot deliver all the required nutrients. Surveys of National Nutrition Monitoring Board indicate that the daily intake of all foods, except cereal and millets in Indian household is lower than the RDA. The proportion of households with energy inadequacy then was estimated at about 70% while that with protein inadequacy was about 27%. Some of the efforts have been directed to ensuring the consumption of a balanced diet. However, this involves people changing their dietary habits, which have been established over generations and is very difficult to change. Protein energy malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies such as vitamin A deficiency, iron deficiency, anemia, iodine deficiency disorders, and vitamin B complex deficiencies are the nutrition problems frequently encountered, particularly among the rural poor and urban slum communities. Recognizing this, there have been several government initiatives which seek to improve the nutrition status in the country. ICDS and AWS, MDM, Poshan Abhiyan, the Janani Suraksha Yojana, the Matritva Sahayog Yojana, the National Health Mission, and the National Food Security Mission, amongst others. In a nutshell, the strategies adopted to address malnutrition deficiencies are dietary supplementation, public health measures, and nutrition and health education in ICDS. However, concerns regarding malnutrition have persisted despite all these initiatives. It is in this context that the National Nutrition Strategy has been released. And it is in this context that food fortification is seen as a very viable and effective strategy. WHO and the FAO have listed it as one of the top four strategies for decreasing micronutrient malnutrition at the global level. Not only is it cost effective, scientifically proven and globally recognized complementary approach. It also easily reaches a wide population, especially the vulnerable population through existing food delivery systems. What's even better is its impact. Fortified foods help to maintain a steady body store for vitamins and minerals when consumed regularly. The Codex Alimentarius defines food fortification as the addition of micronutrients to foods, whether or not they are normally contained in the food, for the purpose of preventing or correcting a demonstrated deficiency. Food fortification is not a new concept. It dates back to the 50s when fortification of Vanaspati with vitamin A was mandated. The addition of nutrients to staples was introduced nearly 70 years ago. In 2005, food fortification achieved another landmark with iodization of salt. Ministry of Food and Public Distribution System has recommended mainstreaming of fortified wheat flour in PDS. And in August 2017, WCF and HRD ministries have made it mandatory to use only fortified wheat flour, fortified edible oil, and double fortified salt in the preparation of ICDS supplementary nutrition delivered through midday meals 
the world's largest school food program. In 2016-17, it provided cooked meals to over 97 million children. Various major states, including Maharashtra, Haryana, West Bengal, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Kerala and Rajasthan, are providing fortified wheat flour through PDS, covering specific districts. Government of India is also prioritizing rice fortification. The Food and Civil Supplies Department in 2019 launched a scheme to introduce fortified rice in 15 districts as pilot in the country through the peace with the financial commitment of about 148 crores in order to address malnutrition and anemia and promote national security, nutrition security. Due to its cost effectiveness against the nutrition accomplishment, food fortification can and will play a major role in eradicating hidden hunger from the nation. FSSAI has now established the level of fortification that is needed in each of the basic foods, namely rice, atta, oil, salt, and milk. Only such standards and standardized processes can provide the requisite micronutrients to the population. The efficacy of the fortification standards introduced by FSSAI will depend on enforcement. Making affordable, good quality fortified food widely available is the key. A well-functioning public distribution system is the best channel to reach precisely those sections that need fortified food the most. And strict enforcement in open market will ensure all consuming population receives adequate fortification. It is a myth that those in higher socioeconomic strata do not suffer from lack of some essential nutrients. Some of the points from an industry perspective that I think are also important for the policy and the program decision makers. There now exists enough capacity to make FRKs. There also exists enough capacity to blend rice with the kernels. Price of FRK has been set by FSSAI and the government, and the budgetary allocations exist. States, however, are still inviting tenders to go for price reduction, which can result in FRKs that do not meet the standards. We recommend that the L1 process should be replaced by states buying at the government fixed price. And we recommend that FSSAI and the states establish very strong testing protocols to ensure that the final fortified foods are delivering the dosage as mandated. With these words, I would like our speakers to take over and help us better understand the situation of the sector, the challenges, and the ways to overcome the hurdles. I would once again like to welcome all the speakers and participants. This platform is basically to understand the status in Northeastern states and the challenges that exist and strategies that may be simulated from other successful case studies. I hope this webinar will provide us with some valuable insights and will be very productive for everybody. With this, I would now like to invite Mr. Vikram Kelkar, MD of Hexagon Nutrition, to share his thoughts on the subject. Thank you very much. Mr. Vikram Kelkar, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vivek Chandra. It was an excellent uh, uh, opening speech. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right. But you have to go into All right. uh, presentation mode. Yeah. Is it okay now? Now you need to go to uh, the full pre full screen mode on your uh, presentation. All right.
Is it visible now? It is, Sir, it is. but I think... Sorry, if you want to go screen mode. Yeah. Uh, Vivek sir, uh, इसको ना duplicate कीजिए sir. यहाँ पे duplicate screen का option आ रहा होगा third option top में left hand side top. Sir left hand side में left hand side. यहाँ पे sir ये timer चल रहा है ना left hand side में इसके top में third option में देखिए duplicate का option हो. आप मुझे बोल रहे हैं सर विवेक सर विक्रम सर सॉरी कहाँ पे है सर ये जो आपके स्लाइड है जहाँ पे टाइम चल रहा है फिफ्टी नाइन अब वन पे आ गया है उसके टॉप में थर्ड ऑप्शन रन ऑन बी ऑन बिहाव ऑफ मिस्टर विक्रम इज इट पॉसिबल Yeah, I think I think it's it's I'm I'm unable to do that. Nevertheless, yeah, no, I can. Oh, yeah. To uh, you know, uh, make sure that we are on time. Maybe I can just uh, speak. Uh, is that okay? That would be fine. Yes. Sir. Perfect. Sir. Perfect. Yeah. 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 And so you can I'll keep moving the slides. You can keep moving yeah. the slides. Your screen is visible, but though not full screen. All right. All right. All right. So um, uh, coming to the agenda, I would start with the nutraceutical industry, followed by the hidden hunger, food fortification, Indian nutraceutical industry overview, factors driving growth of nutraceutical markets in India, nutraceutical industry opportunities during and post COVID-19, and finally consumer and industry trends. What is nutraceuticals? Nutraceuticals is a broad term referred to food or parts of food that provide incremental health benefits that can be and can be segregated under two broad heads. First is the functional food and beverages, and the second is the dietary supplements. And it is important to note that the nutraceutical industry is being uh, regulated by the FSSAI under various regulations, as we have mentioned on this slide. Coming to hidden hunger, also known as micronutrient deficiencies, afflicts more than two billion individuals, or one in three people globally. Even mild to moderate deficiencies can affect a person's well-being and development. In addition to affecting human health, hidden hunger can curtail socio-economic development, particularly in low and middle-income countries. Then food fortification. Um, I think Vivek uh, has already spoken, um, uh, um, you know, quite well on that. So um, just to um, make it more clear that uh, food fortification is a globally proven intervention to address the much prevalent micronutrient deficiencies in the population, and it is the fastest and the cheapest strategies to reach hundreds of millions with improved intakes of essential micronutrients through food fortification. The practice of adding one or more essential nutrients. to a widely consumed food let's have a look at the indian nutraceutical industry india's nutraceutical market is expected to grow at a cagr of 21% occupying at least 3.5% of the global market by 2023 as we can see the market in 2019 was 30 37500 crores and with a cagr of 21% it is likely to grow to 82500 crores but uh, globally if we see india's uh, share is only 3.5% coming to the indian food fortification premix market it has been growing uh, rapidly at a cagr of 23.2% annually between 2015 and 2019 reaching a value of more than 1.7 billion rupees The market will continue to show an impressive growth over the next five years, with a projected CAGR of around 18% for the period 2020 to 2025. As we can see, uh, you know, from a research uh, which was done in 2018, market research, the majority of the premix that is consumed is 
in the food staples, uh, the staple food fortification, uh, about 35%, followed by the sports nutrition and dietary supplements, infant and early nutrition, beverages, and processed foods. And within the staple food fortification, the maximum amount of premix in terms of value is being consumed by the edible oil fortification. Now let's have a look at the factors driving the growth of nutraceutical markets in India, the demand drivers, malnutrition status in India and micronutrient deficiency, awareness, increasing concern about nutrition, awareness and access to information have led to an increase in the health, use of health supplements and nutraceuticals. Affluence of working population with changing lifestyles and dietary patterns and increase in disposable income. Affordability, increasing costs of hospitalization are driving consumers towards health supplements and nutraceuticals. And finally, FSACI food fortification regulations. This is also one of the demand driver. Coming to the supply drivers, with India transforming into a global manufacturing hub, there is a strong impetus for nutraceutical product manufacturers to set up production facilities in India. Strong economic growth with encouraging macroeconomic indicators. Strategic location with access to all major shipping routes, low cost of labor, large pool of technical and skilled labor, easy availability of ingredients, and strong distribution networks coupled with accessibility of products to e-commerce. Then coming to the nutraceutical industry opportunities during and post COVID-19. The demand for vitamin A, C and D and zinc supplements have spiked in the past seven months. Youngsters below 30 years of uh, 30 years old have started to prioritize their spending on nutraceuticals. There's a shift from buying nutraceutical products from specific health issues such as osteoporosis, arthritis, hypertension to immunity building nutraceuticals. Immunity based products will have a continued demand post COVID-19. Targeting other factors affecting immunity can be the key in formulating immunity products. You know, areas such as stress, sleep de deprivation, gut health, these need to be looked at. And then tap into new dosage formats, branching beyond the usual supplements format. Few emerging formats are tea, coffee shots, nutrition bars, table spread, gummies, cheese, almond milk with DHA, and meal replacement products making products more enjoyable to consume. This will help boost the usage frequency. Let's have a look at the various gazettes uh, notifications issued by the FSSAI. Uh, most of us are aware of the uh, 2018 staple uh, food fortification regulation. And during 2020, uh, there was also the FSSAI processed foods, uh, juices, bakery item regulations and uh, also the foods for the infant nutrition regulation during 2020. Looking at the consumer and industry trends in 2020, the pandemic has caused apparent trends in lifestyles and eating behaviors. There is a shift from curative to preventive care in the Indian market. Inclusion of exercise, diet, use of over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements is becoming a way of life. People have become more conscious of their wellness and preventive care. As we say, prevention is better than cure. Building immunity is one of the top priorities. Consumer behavior is moving from replenishment only to daily fulfillment. Thus, changing consumer behavior in the country is also transforming the nutraceutical space. Let's have a look at the industry trends. India leads the APAC market with the highest number of functional foods and beverages launches that bear the, bears the immune system benefits since March. So these are some of the products that have been launched. And health and dietary supplements also witness various launches. Existing brands change their communication focusing on immunity. And then uh, we have this uh, photo of a family consuming various foods and beverages, all of which can be fortified. These are our list of some of our products of hexagon nutrition. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure um, being here on this Asocham forum.
Uh, today, we are fortunate to have a galaxy of uh, spe eminent speakers, senior government officials, and uh, uh, leaders from the industry and also from the NGOs and the supranational organizations. Thank you, Asucham, for um, uh, the initiative, taking the initiative of organizing this event. And uh, once again, thanks to uh, Mr. Vivek Chandra for the opening remarks. Very well said, sir. And best wishes for the rest of the forum. Look forward to see you on the next forum soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelker. Very interesting and opening remarks, which gave perspective about the industry, where nutraceuticals is going, and the food fortification. And we'll hear more of that. Uh, now I'd like to move over to here from the northeastern states about uh, their perspectives challenges opportunities and to kick this off may i invite shri tapan kumar das additional director food civil supplies consumer affairs for the government of tripura to please give us his opening remarks and his special address thank you uh, thank you so much for inviting me in that uh, webinar Actually, I am uh, the additional secretary and director, food and civil supplies department, Dr. Tripura. Uh, I, it was a very nice presentation. What I have just I have seen uh, two presentation. What uh, you have presented your uh, webinar through webinar. Uh, in our state, Tripura, I'll say that Tripura is a deficit state. Here, whatever uh, food grains and required for the state is we are mostly dependent on FCI. We are getting all the food grains from the FCI, including that uh, rice as well as uh, wheat. So in that case, there is very little scope for our state to have uh, that fortification. Uh, since uh, we are getting the rice, uh, including wheat and everything from the FCI, so since uh, and government of India has taken decisions to uh, supply the fortified rice uh, for the midday meal as well as uh, social welfare department, that is ICDS uh, projects. So we are getting that uh, fortified rice from the FCI as initial stage. Though for our state is uh, having less uh, milling facilities in our state and there is only three big rice mills are there. Since whatever uh, food grains we are uh, growing in the state, it is not sufficient for, uh, for our uh, consumption of our state people. So in that case, uh, actually we are uh, fully uh, dependent of the outside of the state, means uh, other part of the uh, country. So it has been uh, here, it has been fortification. Government of India also uh, emphasizes on fortification of rice, fortification of food grains and everything. So that is the very, very uh, time, timely uh, uh, action, whatever action you have taken or whatever webinar you have organized, that will be helpful for the uh, people of uh, Northeast, including our uh, state. So I'm very much uh, uh, fortunate that uh, I have got the chance to uh, participate in that webinar. So uh, I wish uh, that webinar will be very much helpful for us. Since uh, uh, we don't have uh, that much of uh, food trains productivity in the state, uh, which is sufficient for consumption of the uh, state people. So we are fully dependent on the uh, other part, uh, other uh, state uh, of, of our country, and we are getting accordingly. So in that case, uh, for the preparation for supply of the food trains, means uh, fortified food trains from FCI, we have uh, already planned and it has been starting in our state from 1st April 2021. So we are uh, ready to accept uh, food trains from the uh, FCI. FCA also ready to supply that food, that food trains in case may not. Then later on, after getting that uh, food trains uh, from the uh, FCA for uh, for, uh, for uh, midday meals as well as uh, serious centers, serious projects, then state will consider and central government has uh, decided to uh, increase the supply of food trains to all the PDS consumers. So, uh, Director of Food and Civil Supplies Department. I am hopeful that uh, whatever uh, discussion take place today, it will be helpful for the uh, for my knowledge also. It will helpful. Uh, it will increase my knowledge.
knowledge as well as <coughs> it will be helpful for better uh, combination as well as uh, for further increasing the ability or uh, to guide the local people of our state. Thank you so much for providing me a scope to be a part of that uh, webinar. I hope that webinar will be very much helpful and very much uh, fruitful. Thank you so much from the uh, part of the state government as well as food and supply department. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's encouraging to note that the first April, the program is going to start via FCI supply in MDM and in the ICDS. And we hope that they will, as you as you have hope that they will extend it to other PDS and move from there on. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I would now like to invite Dr. Devan Shyadav, Deputy Commissioner, Food and Civil Supplies Government of Arunachal Pradesh, to please give his special address. Uh, may I invite Dr. Devan Shyadav? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chandra. Good afternoon, all the esteemed members. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm Zooming population. And uh, when we look at the NFHS 4 data, because NFHS 5 was uh, not released for the state of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, then we would see that uh, for, for iron folic acid, only 11% of the pregnant women consumed for more than 100 days. While if we look for vitamin A, which is another micronutrient, uh, then only 25% children in the age group of 9 to 59 months have consumed it. Uh, both these micronutrients are distinct in the way that iron folic acid has to be consumed. This we can't hear you. Now, come Devanshri, to Dr. Devansh, I think there is a challenge. Uh, you can switch off your camera and then speak. There is some network connectivity problem. Yeah. Yeah, now it's audible. Is it okay now? Yes, yes. yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, around a quarter of the population uh, of children is stunted, and 17% are wasted, and 20% are underweight this is despite the normal presumption that northeast is uh, having a pretty good health indicators and, and there is no shortages uh, because of the limit so Dr. Hello. Devansh, we've lost you again. Vivekji, can, can we uh, invite the next speaker in the meanwhile? Right. And uh, while we can do that, uh, I'm not sure how we will connect just, but maybe your technical person can. So sorry, Dr. Devansh, Yadav, we'll have somebody from SOHM IT connect with you. But uh, may I now invite Shri Sachin Jaiswal, Joint Secretary, Department of Agriculture, Government of Nagaland, to give his special address, and then hopefully we can connect back with Dr. Devan Shadar. Uh, Shri Jaiswal ji, please. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, esteemed guests. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, uh, I'm filling in for my uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I am filling in for my additional uh, APC, the Agricultural Production Commissioner of the state. He is uh, out for some uh, meeting with Honorable CM of the state. So 
uh, yesterday evening uh, uh, i was slotted to speak here uh, on the very important topic of uh, fortification of staple food grains and the way ahead so of course uh, it was a great uh, uh, learning experience for us also uh, speaking to the uh, to, uh, listening to the earlier speakers now as a uh, earlier uh, spoken by uh, the additional secretary and uh, additional director of food and uh, pds of uh, the department of tripura mr tapan so i think the if not the entire northeast but uh, mainly the smaller states among the northeastern states also predominantly nagaland arunachal pradesh manipur sikkim tripura maybe assam uh, we can uh, take it as a different as a bigger state because predominantly all us all these states we don't have enough rice production the majority of the state as far as the mid term is are concerned the pds things are concerned uh, and as, as far as the icds schemes are concerned we are dependent on the uh, food grains supplied by the fci of course it's a bigger challenge whenever these grains these fortified grains will be supplied the state is always forthcoming and looking forward to it at the same time says in the production aspect maybe not sooner maybe later we can uh, try to have mills bigger mills here also but talking in the present context as most of the farmers are subsistence farmers and uh, a lot of it's not that we, uh, the rice varieties are not there we have uh, so many indigenous rice varieties uh, talking specifically about the state of nagaland also where uh, the rice research, research institutes uh they they are in fact on the on a yearly basis at least two three uh rice varieties are being worked upon and new genomes are being also inducted but the main problem again is about the commercial production of it so this also is a challenge in the state at the same time uh what i would uh, at the national perspective what i would like to uh suggest is that uh, since it's a greater challenge of accept acceptability because as a uh, for people uh, in the upper strata of the society it's easier to con convince people but people if we talk about fortified rice it's a very difficult uh, uh, i would say the mindset to change it also we have been eating rice for 500 years 1000 years or what not people may come up with such ideas also why why we need to supplement that and add medicines to it so i think it will be a uh, the it the approach should be a big myth buster i would say where the collaboration of the industry and the government needs to go together so that this myth also needs to be broken that we are not feeding medicine the fortification staple grain are supplements where the micronutrients and the vitamins will be supplemented in the regular diet and it will go a long way uh, in the in sup, in supplementing <clears throat> the nutritional uh, value of the food that we eat so Uh, and now for example in the states of north is like in nagaland we are speaking about midday meal now in nagaland there's no concept of lunch as per se because people students in fact they have their morning they they prefer morning lunch uh, which is around 7:30 8 am just before they go for school so this whole concept of midday meal also may, does not do not directly fit in nagaland so maybe some uh, uh some uh, i would say scheme have to be dovetailed to suit the local uh, dynamics of the state also so that the nutritional requirements of the people are met as per region specific rather than uh, formulating an entire uh, a bigger flex flagship scheme for the entire state because within the northeastern states also there's a lot of diversity among intra state and inter state uh, uh, eating habits and uh, the lifestyle they live so as uh, as i have already said that since on the production front we are a resource uh, crunch state and at this this very moment uh, we all uh, depend on the uh, supplies of the food corporation of india so the the state government will be very welcome and will partner together so that uh, how to inculcate this habit of taking uh, uh, this fortified uh, staple grain and how to in in that that in the in the food chain of the state so this is from my side thank you so yeah, thank you mr jaswal i i think some really interesting points that you raised 
which are worth considering about how the basic beliefs and habits also need to be taken into account. I think the fact that you uh, said the psychological barrier that this is good food and not medicine, that education and awareness, I think that's a very valid point. The point about the food habit or the dietary habit uh, where lunch is not really consumed and therefore a scheme which accounts for how food is consumed. And then the hope and the vision that in the future, the indigenous varieties and the millers there can step up to do fortification in the state. I think three extremely valid points and thank you for raising those and uh, people who are listening and I hope we'll be able to take these forward. Thank you. Uh, do we now, can we connect with Dr. Devan Shiyadav? Nirupma ji? Uh, sir, Dr. Devansh is here. Uh, yeah. Okay. We can see him yeah. in the panel. I, I just yeah. hope the connection doesn't disconnect between because uh, it is happening quite frequently. Uh, still, I'll just try to uh, continue. Uh, so, uh, Arunachal has been predominantly a rice consuming population. And uh, as NFHS survey suggests, the uh, population uh, of children which has been there, 24% of, th of them have been found to be stunted, 17% wasted, and 20% underweight. Uh, so, we are looking at uh, one of the studies which uh, we had conducted. Uh, last year this study was for a period of 100 days and simultaneously one of my colleague was doing the, a similar study in the district of Gorakhpur. Uh, he was the BDO over there and I was the additional deputy commissioner. So he studied iron, folic acid, vitamins and also albendazole while I I gave to 1000 of my children iron folic acid and 1000 were in the control group so i would find good next page please yeah uh, so what we found is that when we compare the test and control groups the parent Parameters of height, weight, and MUAC, mid upper arm circumference, which is a, a fairly reliable measure of acute malnutrition. What we found is that MUAC and both. parameters which are weight height and MUAC and maximum improvement was seen in the age group of three to four years when compared to age group of five to six years. So what this was suggested that if fortification is done at an earlier age results are also larger and a similar study which was done in Gorakhpur had similar results and uh, so what I would like to and lost you uh, maybe the, now invite the next speaker uh, Vivekji. Yes. Um... Well, we're sorry about this, but may I now invite yeah. this Inosh Inoshi Sharma, Director FSSAI. Yeah, uh, so I hope I'm audible again. Uh, Dr. Yadav, we've lost you again. Maybe if you were to try without um, a video, then we might be able to hear the audio.
Sir, I think uh, till then we can have the inputs from uh, Dr. Ms. Anushi Sharma. So may I please invite Ms. Anushi Sharma, please, Director FSSAI, uh, for her special address on government policies and their implementation and the challenges faced. Ms. Anushi Sharma, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I have this uh, little short PPT which I'll be showing. Uh, I hope it's visible. Yes, yes it is. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, when we talk about fortification, um, usually, you know, there are so many speakers here who have already talked about it. And, and I believe there's a technical session also after this where, you know, the nuances of fortification, the importance will be talked about. Being an FSSAI, you know, the Apex Regulatory Authority, I just thought what becomes really important is just to highlight at this particular forum why the need has, you know, really emerged for something like this and what is it that we can really do about it also? Because uh, those present here are from the government. They are in a position to actually bring about that change through policies and decisions. We've got development partners who can actually assist states, assist the government in actually bringing about that behavioral change among the community in implementing these programs. This is just a general slide about the situation in our country in terms of the foodborne illnesses, in terms of the NCDs, and in terms of the micronutrient deficiencies which are prevalent in our country. And because of this, what we find is the huge cost that it is actually taking on our country of almost $12 billion in terms of GDP. And if we look at the women and children from the NFHS 5 data, which has come for the 22 states, we realize that almost 58% of our women and children are anemic. So one of the solutions, of course, is fortification about which we are going to have this huge discussion. But beyond fortification, how do we bring about that culture of accepting that fortified food is something that we need, bringing about that behavioral change of how we need to incorporate a balanced diet? For this, we've got the Eat Right India initiative, which is based on the three pillars of safe health as well as on sustainability. The mandate of FSSAI, therefore, as a regulator is to set up standards, conduct food testing, ensure food safety compliance. But as an enabler, when we leave the um, farm gate and reach out beyond, we want to make sure that the food at the processing, storage, distribution, retail preparation level it's something which is edible, not just in terms of safety, but it is also nutritious and therefore provides us with all our micronutrients and all our other requirements. So safety, health and sustainability becomes the Eat Right India movement. Some of the regulatory framework that we are also working on is front of the pack labeling for high salt fat sugar uh, foods for elimination of trans fat and beyond you know setting up standards for fortified food so we don't just have uh, standards for the five staples that were talked about milk wheat oil double fortified salt and rice but also in december 2020 we came out for processed food breakfast cereals biscuits as well as um, juices then we also believe a lot of training and capacity building needs to be done so we've created the eat right toolkit which we've already shared with the Ministry of Health for the training of the frontline workers in the health and wellness centers and also with WCD so that the Anganwadi workers are also aware about the importance of fortification. Because simply introducing a program without actually telling the benefits about it will not really serve the purpose or its acceptance in all. What we also are working is on benchmarking and certification. Now, this is something that we are working on uh, with the vendors, the uh, individual restaurants, retail, schools, institutions, so that these places also adopt fortified foods in their menus as well as ensure safety so that people don't fall ill. If I have a foodborne illness, then the absorption of the micronutrients in the food would not happen. We are also trying to nudge food businesses. If they are present here today, I would really request them to adopt the fortified staples because we've come out with um, uh, fortification uh, with the standards for processed food, please do introduce fortification in your 
products. Make sure that there is a reduction of fat, salt, and sugar. Reduce the wastage of food. You know, promote food donation and try to have alternatives to plastic packaging. So, with regards to food fortification, you know, we've we've got a dedicated food fortification resource center based in FSSAI. This is just a timeline about the various processes which have been going on. In fact, way back in 2016, we had the operational standard guidelines for food fortification. And since then, of course, we've got the proper standards where we mentioned the um, range minimum and maximum of the micronutrients. They've been adjusted to about 30 to 50% of the RDAs, but they will again be changed based on the recent NIN reports. They are, the, the fortifications are primarily plant-based. And um, since uh, 1st of July 2019, the enforcement has also begun with this regard. So the plus F is the logo, which needs to be um, you know, told to people with regards to the recognition of a food item as being fortified. And what we have also recently done is we have got in touch with NAFID as well as Kendriya Bhandar in Delhi and we will be providing fortified rice and double fortified salt at its various outlets. Uh, we will be closely monitoring, um, you know, the IC, uh, the acceptance and what are people's opinions about it and subsequently be scaling it up throughout the country. We are closely working with DOFPD uh, as well as WCD and the Ministry of Education for introducing fortified staples. WCD and uh, MH, uh, Ministry of Education have already said that in their midday meal scheme and ICDS, as on 1st of April, fortified um, staples will only be used. We also have a lot of IC uh, material which is available in almost 13 languages. We would request um, all those who are interested, these are freely downloadable on our website and they can be easily utilized. Um, we, we are also in the process of entering into MOUs with various states and UTs and providing them funds under IEC. So those of you who are present here, next time when you meet your counterparts in the states, please do urge them to utilize the funds that we are providing for IEC and information dissemination regarding fortification. This is our website where all the details regarding the um, um, regulations, tender documents, FAQs, training material, our training partners, our premix suppliers, the suppliers of fortified stables, everything is provided. And these are some of the technical supports which are available. These are the partners with whom we are working. A number of them are present here today in the discussion which will be following. And this is primarily the outcome that we are looking at, you know, significantly reducing the burden of foodborne illnesses and most important, lessening the micronutrient deficiency through dietary diversification, reversing the burden of preventable diet related NCDs, reducing carbon footprint and having a more sustainable food sector. Fortification is one, you know, component which goes a long way in addressing the challenge of micronutrient deficiencies. But um, on its own, you know, it's, it's not something which will tackle all our problems. So what we need to do is have a more holistic approach, which we are trying to achieve. So with that, I'd like to conclude here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Inoshi Sharma. Uh, again, extremely well put together comments and uh, expanding of the whole food horizon from fortification into the total eat right. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to also say to you that we at SOHM want to work with you to create awareness on the right eating habits. And uh, we have written and work to work with you and to be given the eat right India logo so that we can work jointly. So hopefully we'll be able to take that program forward. But thank you so much. Uh, with this, I would like to now uh, hand over to Ms. Deepti Golati, who is the head of programs for Gain India, to take us to moderator uh, into the technical session. So may I please invite Ms. Deepti Golati. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be 
with Asocham and Hexagon and all my very dear partners and of course FSSCI to be uh, you know discussing food fortification especially in the states of uh, northeastern region because these are the states that really we would be focusing on and we have been working a lot but before we move on to the panel discussion i would like to request miss uh, megha mandeke uh, to you know share with us the thoughts and also why uh, we should be fortifying foods and I, before that, I would like to introduce Megha to you. Megha is a registered dietitian with more than seven years of experience in the field of nutrition. She has experience of working with pediatric hemato-oncology in children and has handled various projects and created a training manual on nutrition for pediatric oncology. That's amazing, Megha. So currently, Megha is leading the technical marketing team at Hexagon Nutrition and handling human nutrition portfolio. So now I will request Megha to talk about the role of micronutrients in combating hidden hunger through food fortification. I would also like you to share your insights regarding the processes involved in the development of right type of quality assured premixes so that the right formulations are available which are quality assured to make the stable food fortification successful. Now over to Definitely. you, Megha. Definitely. Thank you so much for the brief introduction, ma'am. Uh, so before moving on to the presentation, I would like to thank uh, the speakers at the inaugural and also at the round table for giving us such a good insights. And uh, you know, by this, we will make sure that you know we come into action and take necessary steps to eradicate hidden hunger. Uh, so moving on to my presentation, my presentation will mainly focus on the role of micronutrients to combat hidden hunger. Yeah. Uh, so what is hidden hunger? Hidden hunger is basically the deficiency of crucial micronutrients, which negatively impacts not only the health, but also the survival, the cognitive function and the economic development of the country. These deficiencies and their negative health consequences affect approximately 2 billion people around the world. And India, with a high burden of micronutrient deficiency, specifically of that of vitamin A, iodine, iron, and folic acid, leads to night blindness, goiter, anemia, and various birth defects. According to the NFHS spy survey, which was recently published, which covered approximately 17 states and five union territories together, put together, it's just half of the India's population. It showed that 13 out of 22 states showed an increase in childhood stunting. 12 out of 22 states showed, showed an increase in childhood wasting and 16 out of 22 states show an increase in childhood underweight population. So that's a huge number if you see. And also 68.4% of the children and 66.4% of the women suffered from anemia in 2019. This is, uh, this is actually a quick glance of NFHS 5 uh, survey. So uh, instead of you know accommodating 22 states, Oh, only 10 states that was that was shared with me from one of the uh, newspaper article only 10 states were uh, you know uh, at a quick glance they compared it with the last year's nfhs survey and also compared it with other states uh, i'll not go through all the parameters but the major parameters that were covered were anemia wasting that is low weight for height underweight that is low weight for age and stunting which is low uh, height for age so amongst this the major states that showed an increase in the number of all these parameters are Maharashtra, Gujarat, Himachal and West Bengal. So uh, this uh, slide actually justifies it right that it's time for action. Right. So what is the way to tackle this situation? How do we tackle this situation? So as food fortification as rightly mentioned by Vikram sir in the inaugural, food, certificate, uh, sorry, food fortification is uh, one of the globally proven strategy to combat uh, micronutrient deficiency. It is the fastest, easiest, cost effective and sustainable strategy to reach million and hundred of uh, uh, population. Uh, according to the Food Agricultural Organization and also according to WHO, they have initiated that food, they have uh, they have said that food fortification is one of the major strategy to reduce micronutrient deficiency. And what do you mean by fortification? What exactly is fortification? So fortification is mainly enrichment 
of vitamins and minerals vitamins whether it be water soluble vitamins or fat soluble vitamins depending on the application of the food product we are working on and minerals such as iron folic acid uh, zinc etc so these are enriched into the food product and that's what food fortification is now as inoshi ma'am brightly uh, said what all you know initiatives the fssa has covered and she has briefed it all i will just uh, focus on like two three uh, uh, initiatives that uh, you know that actually come uh, up to the general population is the f plus logo for the all the state uh, for uh, staple foods such as milk oil wheat flour rice and uh, salt so once this f plus logo is then the staple product the general population know that yes this product is fortified so this is the uh, very good initiative taken by fssai and also eat right india campaign which is not popular you know it's not a platform for general public they have made sure that they'll uh, uh, call all the celebrities all the uh, influencers the uh, consumer organizations civil society together to work on one goal of healthy eating they also create e booklets and pamphlets uh, for a general awareness of the population and many things that have that inoshi ma'am have also shared uh, in her presentation right now so when you talk about fortification what would be the cost of fortification it's uh, like one if we, if we think like we are adding uh, adding or enriching these uh, micronutrients into the food which means the cost of the food will go high but that's not the thing if you see milk which is fortified with vitamin a and d2 the cost of fortification per liter of milk is less than 1 paisa okay if we say oil which is again enriched with fat soluble vitamins like vitamin a and vitamin d2 per liter of milk is less than 10 paisa flour which is enriched with iron folic acid and vitamin b12 per kg of flour is less than 5 paisa frk which is fortified rice kernel which is fortified by iron folic acid and vitamin b12 per kg is less than 10 paisa and that's what is the cost of fortification the recent gazette notification issued by fssa which is already highlighted by inoshi ma'am and also by vikram sir at the inaugural i'll just glance through it uh, first is the staple food fortification which we already mentioned in my initial slides then is processed food fortification or the application that are covered are bakery bakery products juices cereal products and confectionery so we know that there is a law here they have set a standards you know to fortify these uh, products then also food for infant uh, nutrition regulation which covers infant milk formula milk cereal based complementary foods and processed cereal based complementary foods uh, in this regulation also formula for special uh, special children are also covered like inborn error of metabolism and also lactose intolerance is also covered so when you talk about premix what all accreditation and certifications we have okay we majorly focus on food quality and to ensure the safety of the consumer we have we are fssci certified we are gmp certified and also fssc 2000 22000 certified okay we are iso 9001 9, 2015 certified uh, so we ensure that we meet the statutory and regulatory requirements we are halal, halal certified which means we follow the islamic dietary laws and regulations we are iso and iec certified which means the uh, instruments that we use are well calibrated well calibrated and the analysis will, that we perform use uh, is by using a standard method we are also kosher certified which means we are using jewish or uh, religious dietary laws and regulations so we keep quality control throughout the process in check now as uh, as dipti ma'am said that to focus on this i will majorly focus on this because whatever micronutrient formulation we do before that we analyze the raw material packaging material according to the glp and according to sophist in a uh, on a sophisticated instruments after that we evaluate the results and if we think that this results are not suited or they are not according to the standards we do not use that material the material meets the standards then we move on to the micronutrient formulations which are developed as per client specifications and also with an adequate overage overages to maintain the uh, to maintain uh, the compensation or a process loss since these micronutrients are very sensitive 
after which uh, when when we formulate the temperature and relative humidity has to be in a controlled manner after this the finished goods are analyzed and as per specification and approved once they are approved the result of the finished goods are analyzed and recorded time to time after this entire quality control process then only the pre mix which moves out from our manufacturing manufacturing facility goes to our customer so we make sure that we adhere to the quality assurance or uh, 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 properly that is our prime focus okay so all the pre mix that goes into the food fortification has to be of food grade and with a proper maintained quality the packaging material that we use for liquid premixes is amber colored bottle and also solid premix or powdered premix is tri laminate aluminum okay this packaging forms are used to ensure that the premix contain is safe from external environmental factors like temperature relative humidity etc the analysis the analysis that we do on micronutrient formulation is carried on highly sophisticated advanced instruments like lcms and hplc the chemical and microbiological testing is done as per the client specification and also we adhere to the fssai protocols testing protocols so uh, we offer not only micronutrient premixes for staple food fortification and processed food fortification but also for therapeutic and single nutrients these are some of our esteemed clients which we work with and uh, we will not uh, say it as a client or customer because they are our partners these are few of the therapeutic products uh, that we uh, uh, you know uh, design as per unicef and wfp standards proactiva f75 proactiva 100 proactiva 500 and proactiva rusf prinkles which is a small sachets of 1 gram which is used for food for home level food fortification sprinkles again 1 gram of sachets specifically used for pregnant women and lactating mothers these are few of the partners we have partnered with for therapeutic products we give it to various hospitals for their uh, projects and also for um, uh, treating malnutrition these are few of the ngos that we are working with and we totally believe in atmanirbhar bharat and whatever products are uh, made are made in india but we manufacture it across the world so uh, let's pledge to be atmanirbhar and eradicate malnutrition with indian products so this is the slide which is very close to hexagon nutrition i'm sure vikram uh, sir has uh, yes uh, he did uh, you know present this slide uh, in his presentation as well which says that we are a complete nutrition provider by giving out micronutrient premixes for various application with this i will conclude my presentation in saying that we can conquer if we can conquer space we can conquer hidden hunger as well so thank you so much thank you so much mega for a very very interesting uh, presentation and yes you. as you say that if we can conquer space we can conquer malnutrition Absolutely. but we all need to be very closely working and with lot of dedication because that is what requires to we overcoming hunger and malnutrition Absolutely. so friends uh, we would like to now start with our panel discussion and i'm very pleased to share with you that we have a very eminent panel of speakers representing various key development sector organizations of course i'm from gain but we have very eminent partners from un world food program tata trust and also an eminent industry representation from pristine kalinga all these partner organizations have collectively contributed substantially to reducing malnutrition specifically the micronutrient malnutrition by scaling up staple food fortification in india they are all working very closely with fssci under their support guidance and they also work very closely with all the key ministries of the government of india and their departments at the state level and we all know that food fortification makes very good impact with minimal cost so of course uh, mr vivek has already introduced but i would still like to very briefly touch upon that we have dr sharika yunus with us she is the head of nutrition and school feeding program at wfp she is a medical doctor she looks like a baby 
adolescent girl, but yes, she has 15 years of work experience and she's a very committed public health professional and she has authored several research papers that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. We also have our very dear Mr. Vivek Arora, who has a very rich work experience of over 25 years. He is the senior advisor to Tata Trust in India, and that's something very big, and is leading the malnutrition and food fortification programs. Prior to joining Tata Trust, he was the CEO of uh, Riber Compact, which manufactures the lipid-based nutrition supplements that happen that help to manage uh, severe acute malnutrition. I happen to have used his products while he was there in Compact, and we've been able to reduce micronutrient malnutrition as well as severe acute malnutrition in Rajasthan substantial, substantially. And we thank you, Vivek, for that. Then we have Mr. Durga Prasad. He is a raw material QA and QC in charge at Pristine Kalinga and uh, specifically looking after the best drop light oil. He has an in-depth knowledge as a quality control auditor. He has handled US FDA, MHRA UK, WHO India, FDA Ukraine, ISO 9001 to 2000, and FSSAI audits during the impressive career, which is his career spanning over seven years. And I love to brag that I have been working for 42 years. So together we have over 100 years of experience on this panel, and that really is something we are very happy to share. So Sharika, we know that you would have to leave early. So I would like to uh, start with you, and more so not just because you're about to, you have to leave early, but also because in the entire Northeastern, the most favored staple is rice. You've been working a lot on rice fortification. So I would like to ask you, why do you think rice fortification is so important? And what is the status of rice fortification in the country as well as in the Northeastern states? So over to you, Sharika. Sure, thanks a lot, uh, Deepthi ji, for that very kind introduction. And I also wanted to uh, say a big thanks to both ESOCAM as well as Hexagon Nutrition for giving World Food Program the opportunity to share some of our thoughts on food fortification. Now, why do we think that fortified rice is important? Um, because if we look at the staples which can be used for addressing anemia in the country, there are majorly three staples. It's fortified rice, it's fortified wheat flour, and it's the double fortified salt. Um, and anemia, we know, is, is a huge problem in our country. More than 50% of our children, as well as our uh, women in the reproductive age group, are anemic. Uh, therefore, if we want to tackle anemia, then the options that we have on hand are three. Now, within the three, uh, fortified rice becomes all the more important because it is majorly consumed. It's the predominant staple which is consumed by about 65% of our population as per the latest NSSO data. Uh, it is also a staple which is abundantly distributed throughout the food-based safety net. So in India, we have three major food-based safety nets, the public distribution system, we have the integrated child development services scheme as well as the midday meal. Um, and within all of these three schemes, rice is abundantly distributed. In fact, in some schemes, such as the, um, uh, the midday meal scheme, uh, it's a total of about 83% of rice which flows in the scheme. Uh, whereas in the PDS, as well as the ICDS, it's close to 50% each. Um, and other reason why we think rice is important is that rice is associated with certain processes, such as milling and polishing which lead to removal of some of the micronutrients. Therefore, fortification of rice not only gives us an opportunity to add back what's been removed, but to also add back more than what has been removed. So therefore, make it truly nutritious. Um, I therefore think fortified rice is important for the entire country. Coming specifically to why I think fortified rice is important for the Northeast, um, there's been a uh, for the Northeast, we have the NFHS 5 data for quite a few states. Um, and if we look at, if we do a quick analysis of anemia prevalence um, in the Northeast, what we find is that almost all the states um, have shown an increase in the prevalence of anemia, except for Meghalaya and of course our 
Arunachal Pradesh for which data is not available. Um, if we look at the prevalence of anemia in children in the Northeast, the prevalence is almost, it's more than 40%, which therefore makes it a severe public health problem as per the World Health Organization. And if we look at the prevalence of anemia in women in the reproductive age group, it uh, in about um, four out of eight states in the Northeast, again, the prevalence is more than 40%. So it's it's a severe health, uh, anemia is a severe public health problem, and we need to tackle it with all the solutions that we have at hand, including fortified rice. Um, now coming to the second part of your question, DPG, as to uh, what's the status of uh, fortified rice in the country. Um, and it gives me immense pleasure to say that uh, fortified rice today seems to be uh, the winning horse um, amongst the different fortified staples that we have. The government of India has launched a scheme called the Centrally Sponsored Scheme for uh, Distribution of Fortified Rice. Uh, it's been launched on a pilot basis in 15 districts in 15 states with a total budgetary allocation of 174 crores. Out of these 15 districts, 15 states, fortified rice has already been rolled out in eight districts and states. Uh, we also know that guidelines have been issued both by the Ministry of Women and Child Development as well as the Ministry on Education on inclusion of fortified rice um, in both the safety nets. Um, there is also an, um, a very, um, let's say, forward-looking vision that the government has as far as fortified rice is concerned. They're looking at a three-phased approach towards mainstreaming fortified rice in the safety nets throughout the country. Phase one should be rolled out beginning April 2021, where we should see fortified rice rolled out in the ICDS, the MDM, and the PDS in 112 aspirational districts. This will be followed by phase two, wherein fortified rice will be rolled out in 250 high burden, uh, high malnutrition burden districts. And then phase three, where fortified rice will then be rolled out throughout the country. So we're looking at a very impressive, very ambitious plan as far as fortified rice is concerned. Uh, we also know that there have been discussions in terms of making fortified rice mandatory, both in the open market as well as the social safety nets. I'll stop here um, if you have further questions. Yeah, I think that's a very marvelous progress that has been made in a very short time. And uh, hats off to you and the team path, though they are not here. And of course, uh, leadership by FSSAI, that we are able to scale up uh, fortified rice. And the best part is that it would address <laughs> anemia, which is rampant. One more question I would like to ask you, Sharika, is that Everyone loves success, but I'm sure you have so many challenges that you would have overcome. So what have been the challenges to roll out fortified rice? And what did you do to overcome that? Because that would be a big lesson that we would be uh, taking back home from you. Sure. Uh, so initially, when we started fortified rice, um, one of the biggest challenge was the availability of fortified rice kernels in the country. Um, that uh, challenge to a very, very large extent, uh, at least for the pilot phase in 15 districts, 15 states, and even going forward, that's been taken care of. Um, the other challenge was that India um, um, India is, is a subcontinent in itself. There are certain states in the country which are rice producers, but there are certain states in the country uh, which then take rice from other states through the food corporation of India, uh, for, through the go-downs of the food corporation of India. Um, so there is not one model which can fit the different sort of geographies that, that we sort of cater to. And that's particularly a problem when we talk about the Northeast. Uh, within the Northeast, we know that um, Assam is a rice producer and uh, Assam has also signed up uh, to the centrally sponsored scheme on fortified rice. We know that within the Northeast, Meghalaya has shown a huge amount of interest to roll out fortified rice. Uh, but that is where um, the, the modeling, because the Northeast is hugely dependent on the rest of the country for some of the rice, uh, which needs to be moved through the Food Corporation of India go down. Um, therefore, the scheme that the government of India has uh, in terms of the CSS has not found too many takers in the Northeast. So the solution to, to this could be twofold, either 
uh, the government of India starts fortifying all the rice and therefore it is only fortified rice which finds its way into the uh, northeastern states. Or the other solution could be that till such time we reach that stage, whatever rice is being uh, moved to the northeast at every state entry point if that is fortified. That's a slightly costly proposition, but it is not costly when we look at the costs that we have on anemia. Um, and I think that would be a good short term measure that uh, the northeastern states should explore and look at. I'm aware that Meghalaya is already looking at this particular um, model. Um, this is also the model which has been piloted in different parts of the country. So it's, it's, not, it's a model which already works. Um, and therefore, I think the northeast can definitely look at taking this forward. Thank you so much, Sharika, for a lot of, uh, you know, interesting insights. And I'm sure everyone would mull on these and uh, we would be having so many questions. But uh, uh, since uh, Sharika may not be available, I'll just uh, ask the request if there are any two or three questions that the state government officials may want to ask. We can take them right now before we move on to Mr. Durga Prasad and Vivek. But uh, being in the moderator's position, I have one question and I wish to ask you because I have often wondered that uh, we have so many varieties of rice in India and different varieties also have different uh, densities and specific gravities. So how do you manage the production of FRK to suit the or to match with even if it is not matching the physical appearance but at least the specific gravity of rice because if that is not done and rice is blended with FRK with different specific gravities uh, during the transportation it may lead to some you know settling down or floating up of the FRK so and that's coming from a person who knows nothing about rice fortification and I would love to be enlightened by you. Thank you. Sure. Um, no, thanks a lot, Deepthi Ji, for that particular question. Um, what we have done in the pilots that we've run in several parts of the country and what we advise the state governments is that whatever is the base rice in which the FRK has to be fortified, uh, we request the state governments to share with the FRK suppliers in advance a sample of that rice. Um, so that um, it's the correct matching in terms of the specific gravity, the look, the feel of the rice can be done. Um, so that takes care to a very large extent. And we haven't in, in our experience of having rolled out fortified rice in about five states uh, and having done it on a pilot basis in another four districts um, have come up across issues where there is separation of rice because of differences in specific gravity. Um, so that's taken care of at the at the stage of production of the fortified rice by sharing in advance a sample of the base rice. Thank you so much because that's so reassuring and that would also give a lot of confidence to the state governments that this is indeed very easy to do, doable and scalable. So thank you so much, Sharika. And uh, I can I would like to request our esteemed uh, uh, policymakers from the states of Northeast, if you have any questions regarding uh, rice fortification, you can directly ask Sharika now, or else we can uh, you can put it in the chat box and we will certainly revert to you. Since I hear no questions, I think we can move on to our next panelist. And our next panelist we would like to pose questions to is Mr. Durga Prasad. And of course, why we are taking up uh, oil fortification right after rice is that rice or any food would always taste very good when you have some oil in it. So, Mr. Durga Prasad, I cannot see you here. Are you uh, there? Uh, his, uh, he has lost his connection. So he's trying to join in once again. So you can pose the question to Vivek sir mean, meanwhile. And uh, meanwhile, he's trying to join in the session. Okay. Thank you. So that brings me to Vivek. And Vivek, I'm sure with your milk fortification and rice, we can have a very nice, sweet, healthy here. So uh, tell me, what is the current status of milk fortification in the northeastern region? Because you've done a lot of work on that. And it would be very interesting to share that with our audience. 
So over to you, Vivek. Thank you, Dipti ji. Uh, if you look at uh, India, we have 176 lakh liters of milk getting fortified every day. And uh, Northeastern states have not been behind. Uh, right from the beginning in 2017, uh, Assam, Wamul in Assam took the initiative. Uh, they have a brand called Purabi, and they put about 40,000 liters of uh, milk every day. And uh, we are well represented today by Tripura and Nagaland. Both these states have their uh, cooperative brands, Gomti and uh, Dimul and Milkon. All brands are uh, fortified, so they get fortified milk in their states. Uh, apart from uh, these three states, Manipur is one of the other northeastern states, which again has about five to 6,000 liters of milk, uh, which is fortified. So all in all, if you look at those seven sisters, earlier seven sisters plus Sikkim, then out of this eight, uh, four uh, states are already having fortified milk. Other states like Meghalaya, Mizoram, Arunachal Pradesh, and Sikkim. So Meghalaya, Mizoram have very low quantities of milk, and also uh, not uh, much of the milk is getting you know processed at an organized level. So there are a few challenges as far as the dairy sector is concerned, but it is picking up in the northeastern states. So where it is you know organized and processed properly, uh, those states have already adopted milk fortification. Thank you. And here I would also like to add that from GAIN, we are also working in milk fortification and we are working in 18 states to fortify milk, oil and wheat flour. And I'm very happy to share with my friends and colleagues here and all the audience that with GAIN support on milk fortification, we have been able to reach out 18.5 million people with adequately and appropriately fortified milk, uh, which is being produced both by the private sector as well as by the cooperative dairies. So both Tata Trust and GAIN are partners for you in milk fortification. But Vivek, uh, one more thing I would like you to respond to is that as we are all aware that the uh, FSSAI and Government of India plan to make milk fortification mandatory. So what care we should take so that the consumers benefit the most uh, from milk fort fortified milk and we are able to combat vitamin A and D deficiencies through this mandatory fortification. Uh, you see, uh, uh, it's it's the fortification is in phases. So as initially the focus was, you know, to adopt and see that the fortified uh, uh, staples or uh, are available in the market. Now, uh, as it is getting matured, uh, we also need to ensure that you know the right quality is made in a, is made available in a sustainable way. Now, when we say, when we talk about quality, what happens is when the market matures, there are different things that you need to take care. One, of course, is the premix that goes into it. So the premix quality is of prime importance. And as you know, FSSI has listed, you know, the premix vendors were approved and FSSI also had a price band mechanism to ensure that the pricing that is being charged by the manufacturers is also, you know, uh, correct. So those measures we have been you know taking uh, simultaneously but as we now you know mature into the mandatory part of it and everybody starts fortifying we need to ensure at the ground level that the fso's the labs that are testing the methods that are adopted all this are standardized and they you know they are trained and the capacity is built to ensure right quality of fortified staples available to the consumers. Also, uh, along with this, we also need to ensure that the consumers are aware that, you know, uh, they demand those fortified staples, which will increase the, you know, demand for this such products and people will, or the manufacturers will have value add to provide this fortified staple. So uh, all in all, I would say the focus has to be on uh, maintaining the quality of the products going forward. 
thank you so much and one last question to you uh we are going through a very difficult time and that's why we are meeting virtually and that's on account of covid 19 and uh, everyone thinks of whenever we talk of vitamin a and we talk of vitamin d and micronutrients the first word that comes to our mind is immunity so in the current scenario when the world is battling with covid 19 pandemic how do you say that the fortified milk can play a role in improving nutrition of the consumers or improving their immunity so well, that's a there's a fantastic question i would say that see, you know if you look at uh, the advertisements today uh, any and every product is claiming uh, a, uh, to be providing immunity and and yes. to, to that level i have seen some pans and pani puris also providing immunity so, <laughs> so i would say immunity is the buzzword but uh, and people are you know the manufacturers are selling uh, their product uh, based on uh, the claim for immunity but very uh, few people know that when this fortified staple when we talk about this fortified staple the the vitamin A and D both are responsible in a way to add to your immunity. So by simply, you know, adopting uh, these fortified staples, you are able to contribute to your health. Uh, and, you know, you can also take care of the immunity. Combined together, milk and oil uh, will provide somewhere in between 30 to 50 percent of the required RDA. Uh, uh, which is uh, for a normal consumer. So I would say uh, they have their importance. Also uh, in life, I would say for vitamin A, there are a lot of other sources like uh, carrot or uh, sweet potato, etc. But vitamin D is something which is very um, uh, scarcely available from food. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, in India, sun is something which is abundantly available. But because of our lifestyle, uh, we're not exposing ourselves to sun. So I would say, yes, uh, expose yourselves well to sun. But then uh, even if you're consuming fortified uh, products, you are getting 30 to 40 percent of your RDA, which is good enough. Uh, and then you expose and take the rest from the sun and you will never be deficient. And uh, to everybody's surprise, I would say that, you know, in my team, there were uh, five people working. And when we started working on this, we all got tested ourselves for uh, vitamin D. And uh, believe me, we all uh, were deficient. So we had to take a supplementation uh, dose to cover up uh, and come back to a stage where, you know, now we can maintain our vitamin D levels. So. I would say, yes, uh, fortified, sta uh, fortified staples or fortification is a complementary strategy. Let it be uh, a part of that in your life. And uh, as you consume your staples regularly, they will provide some amount of uh, vitamin A and D and, of course, iron folic acid B12, which are also required uh, and will contribute uh, vitamin a and d definitely will contribute a little bit to improve your immunity thank, thank you. you so uh vivek and i i cannot help but add that uh, we have from gain have been working in rajasthan on oil fortification and milk fortification since 2012 and when we had this comprehensive national nutrition survey data you would not believe my joy was endless because when we looked at the data the average vitamin a deficiency at the national level for children between five years to 19 years ranged between 15.5 to 21.5 percent but in rajasthan in the same age group the vitamin a deficiency was just one to 1.9 percent i couldn't believe it for the first time i really thought that you know maybe my eyes are playing a trick and it may be 10.1 or something like that but even with the magnifying glass it looked 1 to 1.9 and if we are able to bring down the levels of 
vitamin A and vitamin D deficiency with milk fortification and oil fortification, I think this would be a tremendous contribution of all the people who are working in the food domain, whether they are food business operators or in the development sector. Again, while we were talking about rice fortification, since GAIN works in uh, wheat flour fortification, oh, my friend from Tripura has just gone out. We, I will be you know, reaching out to him again. We have been working on wheat flour fortification and in Rajasthan, GAIN supported the government of Rajasthan in providing fortified wheat flour through the PDS. And this was in the time span of 2012 to 2014. And the data for National Family Health Survey for Rajasthan was collected in 2015. And when the report was published, again, it was a very beautiful, uh, I wouldn't say surprise, but it was a very welcome uh, uh, information that in Rajasthan, the anemia levels in women were 46.8% compared to 53% at the national level, even though the iron folic acid tablet consumption in Rajasthan was just 10%, whereas it was 30% at the All India level. So even though the food was not different, even though the iron folic acid tablet consumption of was just about 10%, yet the anemia levels in women both pregnant as well as those in the age group of 15 to 45 years was just about 46.8%. And in men, the All India figure was 23% and in Rajasthan, it was 17%. So friends, food fortification really works. All what we need to do is gear up. And I should also want to share with you that GAIN has been working in the Northeastern states we have uh, we are working very closely with uh, Meghalaya and uh, they have even issued out these circulars that all the oil that would be imported into Meghalaya would be fortified with vitamin A and D. Tapan sir, since I see you back, uh, I also want to bring uh, and I also want to share that in Tripura, you have three mills that are, for, uh, that are producing wheat flour gain through khpt karnataka health promotion trust has trained all the mills to adequately and appropriately fortify wheat flour we are just awaiting your blessings to move forward and mainstreaming fortified wheat flour into the public distribution system as well as into the uh, open market again i would also like to share that in assam we are working very closely with the t estates tea gardens and different tea boards and all these tea gardens tea estates tea boards they have set up their nutri shops the local kirana stores which they which we have renamed as nutri shops and gain is working very closely with the tea garden workers both on creating awareness giving them uh, you know nutrition and health education as well as ensuring that only fortified oil is available through these nutri shops and we are very happy to share with you that currently we are working in 45 uh, uh, you know gardens and 45 nutri shops we are uh, supporting and promoting uh, fortified edible oil which is re reaching over 20000 families in the state so this is my one bit may i now request mr durga prasad if he's able to connect to join us for the panel discussion. Aina, is he there? Dipsi ji, I had one uh, small thing to share uh, since Nagaland and Tripura, they both are here. Uh, I would like to mention uh, about an incidence and uh, this is in Manipur when we launched the, uh, the Chumtang brand of uh, milk, which is the Manipur cooperative. Uh, so there was an IS officer and he mentioned, and as uh, Thapansan also said that culturally the Northeast is very different. And he said that, you know, there is no tradition of a morning glass of milk in, in Manipur and would be similar in the Northeastern states. So uh, he said that, you know, since, you know, I was exposed to uh, the environment in Delhi and I had this habit 
of the morning glass of milk and that helped me you know uh, improve my studies over the years and then he said that you know that can be one reason i could crack the ias exam so that's what he said in uh, uh, in the launch but uh, as he mentioned that, you know uh, we can also bring in a change since you know this uh, milk is uh, providing good nutrition to children i would request the policy makers to see and consider that you know uh, if possible uh, they can uh, approach the dairies in the state and if they can provide a glass of fortified milk to the children uh, it will contribute to improve the nutrition of the children in the state and uh, they will get into the habit of drinking milk gradually so i agree with you that yes some policies need to uh, change because the culture is different but somewhere we can start new practices to see that the nutrition is improved and the child nutrition is improved so uh, if there is any comment from tapan sir or uh, 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 mr deswal i think yeah, then then please Yes, uh, you are very rightly pointed out, uh, Tripura, uh, just like uh, other part of Northeast. Uh, uh, people are very fond of uh, milk and everything. Uh, in that case, uh, you have mentioned that uh, our Gumati milk, yes, Gumati milk is fully fortified, fortified milk supplied in the, uh, uh, particularly in the western, uh, west district, west rural district of that part, and it covers uh, um, entire. Uh, city areas city areas of the state and another um, new milk uh, manufacturing unit also came up in the last uh, on 6th of uh, uh, january they have uh, just inverted their uh, plant which is this uh, uh, mother nature plus in the name of mother nature plus they are also uh, well, i know them because they are in other uh, way they are our stakeholder for our food and civil supply department they are also planning for the supply of a fortified milk. So in that case, in case of milk, the people will largely uh, they are getting that uh, fortified milk. And some of the parts still remain uh, untouched, particularly in the hilly region, hilly part of our state. You know, uh, more than 60% of our state is uh, hilly, hilly area. In that uh, hilly areas, we could not, uh, still we could not reach. But our effort will be there our uh, effort will be there so that we can reach there also. Uh, regarding uh, that fortification in the floor, uh, Atta, that uh, recently we had a meeting with our uh, millers. We are also planning so that we can introduce uh, some new thing. Uh, since uh, rice uh, we are getting from the FCI, uh, after fortification we are getting, first piece we are getting from the, uh, for the ICTS as well as midday meal. Now, therefore, for the rest of the PDS system, we are hopeful that uh, that will be introduced very shortly by the ministry. Since we are the shortfall deficit state, we entirely will receive from the FCI. So, in that case, in that uh, wheat also for fortification of food, we are also planning so that uh, that can be implemented in our state. Uh, I had a preliminary meeting with that uh, floor mills. They are also ready. One floor mills, they are ready. They have uh, already procured their machineries and everything. They have set up. They have have their setup, but uh, due to COVID uh, situation, they could not uh, uh, introduce uh, that uh, fortification of uh, flow and everything in the in, uh, in their mill. So that uh, progress is there. We are we are hopeful that uh, we are going to definitely try to switch over to fortification, fortified rice, uh, and as well as fortified uh, flow so that uh, we can supply that uh, nutritious uh, uh, at least uh, food items to the uh, people of our state that is my uh, that is uh, i want to add here thank you so much sir that's very very reassuring all i can say is that it is with you for you always and we also want to share we request you that like meghalaya has done uh, because all the edible oil that comes into the northeastern states is from the other parts of the country and not really manufactured in uh, in the in respective states so if you can uh, 
uh, you know, if you would agree, perhaps you could even issue out these, uh, you know, uh, guidelines or even the order to say or the circular to say that all the oil that comes into the state should be fortified adequately with vitamin A and D. And with all the uh, imports from different states that are of oil that are coming into your states, GAIN takes on the responsibility of ensuring quality and uh, quality of fortification. So we would uh, discuss these things with you bilaterally again, but I'm very grateful to you, sir, for uh, you know sharing with us your vision of a healthier uh, Tripura as well as the entire Northeastern states. So uh, may I please uh, uh, check if uh, Mr. Durga Prasad is available on oil fortification? Ma'am, he is here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Prasad, for being there. We know that uh, technology is a challenge and uh, sometimes it fails exactly when we don't want it to fail. But we are happy that you are back. And uh, so I would like you to share with us why do you think that fortification of edible oil is necessary in India? And what are the precautions that you should be taking during the fortification process? Since you come from quality assurance, quality control, I'm sure you would be able to throw brilliant light on it. Over to you, Mr. Prasad. Uh, sir, please unmute yourself. Durga, sir. Mr. Prasad, we are not able to hear you. I think you have to unmute yourself. Aina, can you please help in case he is not able to unmute? Yes, ma'am. I'm just uh, calling him to ask if there's any problem with the audio. I'm just asking. In case Mr. Prasad is not able to uh, join, please let me know because I can respond on oil fortification on his behalf, not for his uh, experience, but from whatever experience we have in fortification. So Aina, please let us know. Okay, while we wait for uh, uh, Mr. Prasad to join. I would... Yes, ma'am, I've yes. asked him to unmute him, himself and he's just trying to do it. Uh, meanwhile, can you take a question from the uh, audience? We sure, have please. a few questions. Yeah, please share your questions with us so that I can direct it to the right person. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so we have a question that can food fortification be carried out at a micro enterprise level? Uh, Vivek, would you like to answer this question? The question is that can fortification uh, be undertaken at the micro enterprise level? Yeah, see, uh, it depends on what staple uh, you're talking about. So first, we'll have to be very specific as to what staple is being talked about. Uh, definitely, there there is a certain uh, uh, capacity or quantity that is required to fortify. But yes, uh, definitely at a small uh, scale, the fortification is possible. So. Uh, See, just to give you an example, uh, so, so across India, there are big dairies handling 30 lakh liters, 25 lakh liters of milk, as if we talk about milk. But uh, when we talk about northeastern states, Tripura is handling about 5,000 liters of milk, and um, say uh, Nagaland is handling 6,000 at two locations, so 3,000 liters of milk at each location. And, uh, still they are able to you know fortify the milk and package it so uh, 
uh, that willingness uh, uh, is important and uh, you need to find out your ways to ways and means to uh, control uh, the quality that initiative needs to be taken but it is possible to do it at a smaller scale i would like to also add that uh, we have substantial experience of fortifying wheat flour at the chakki level also we uh, had this project in udaipur uh, udaipur's two districts salumbar and uh, Sal, uh, you know sarada districts and we were working with 200 local chakki millers in the villages and believe it or not it was possible it was doable and it really made a lot of difference to the health of people and also to the uh, you know anemia levels in that area only thing the only big challenge was that you need to have an aggregation of these uh, micro enterprises because sometimes those who are working at the village chakki level may not be so savvy to source premix from the premix supplier otherwise training is doable they have done it very well the compliance to the fssci standards was almost 67 percent which was very surprising so it is very easy to do it makes the difference the um, millers or at the micro level who are even just fortifying five kgs of wheat even they five kgs of wheat to make it into a wheat flour were able to fortify because we had you know prepared premix as a pre-blend and given them measures on how it could be added to the hopper and they were doing it brilliantly so it is doable but uh it requires additional efforts from those who are going to train them that's it again as uh, vivek has mentioned about milk oil may be a little challenging but uh, milk and wheat flour are doable and i'm sure same way rice is also doable even though uh, sharika is not here to substantiate that Rice is also very Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your answer. I think that will uh, suffice our uh, guest for today. And uh, I think, ma'am, there is a problem with Durga sir's uh, audio. I think he's not able to connect it some uh, or the other. So if you can just give us a brief about oil fortification. Yes. Now, uh, I think there's a little bit of disturbance. Someone's uh, mic is on. Uh, with respect to oil fortification, and why is it necessary in india yes it is very necessary in india because like salt which is consumed by everyone oil is also one commodity that is consumed by everyone so there is universal consumption of edible oil and again fortification of edible oil with vitamin a and d is very very easy to do government of india in 1953 a time when even I was not born, I'm ancient, but even I was not born at that time. The government of India made it mandatory to fortify Vanaspati with vitamin A. Now, as the science progress, we do realize that Vanaspati is trans fats, not really very good for health. So everyone shifted from Vanaspati to uh, non-hydrogenated fats, which are the edible oils somehow we missed on the uh, you know transferring the same logic of fortification of vanaspati to the fortification of edible oil and thanks to fssi it has taken up again and now all the oil that is produced in the country would very soon be made mandatory to be fortified because everyone consumes edible oil and the national sample survey organization has shown that uh, on an average people are consuming 25 to 30 grams of oil per person per day that is a reasonable quantity that is that if fortified would provide good levels of vitamin a and d and as i mentioned in my earlier uh, uh, you know comment that we have been fortifying milk and oil in rajasthan since 2012 
in 2016 government of rajasthan took the initiative of getting all the oil millers together telling them about their their contribution in reducing micronutrient malnutrition specifically of vitamin a and d and they got all the oil manufacturers to voluntarily commit to fortification and hence it became a voluntary mandatory uh, model of oil fortification in rajasthan which is continuing till date and the industry is contributing industry is very supportive of fortification because for cost of fortification of oil is also just about 10 pesa per liter which is minimal so oil fortification is very easy to do everyone consumes oil so if we add vitamin a and d it would reach out to each and every one because all consume oil and we would be able to combat vitamin a and d deficiencies which are a public health problem in india secondly what are the issues that you know uh, you know we have to face the as problems when we look at oil oil also has some elements like free fatty acids it if the peroxide value of oil is high beyond three then all the vitamin a and d that you add that gets used as antioxidant to preserve the quality of oil so whenever we are doing fortification of edible oil we need to ensure that the base quality of oil is good that the free fatty acids are not there and the peroxide value of oil is less than two then only fortification would have its desired impact but when we talk of the oil quality this is not something that i'm saying to promote fortification if you look at the fssci guidelines the eggmark guidelines or the bureau of indian standard guidelines for the oil quality because fssci eggmark bis they give out standards for the basic food commodity that it should have saponification value at this level it should have free fatty acids at this level it should have uh, you know peroxide value at this level so if the oil manufacturers adhere to the quality parameters for ordinary edible oil which are mandated by fssci then fortification is a brilliant thing to do and it would surely make an impact so we need to ensure that all the oil that is produced and sold in the market adheres to the basic oil standards which are enunciated by fssci and if those basic standards are adhered to fortification would do its magic and reduce micronutrient malnutrition specifically of vitamin a and d in the people who are consuming that fortified edible oil then when it comes to the process of fortification process of fortifying edible oil is the easiest because we have a uh, oil premix oil based premix which is to be added to oil so it only requires stirring it well of course since we are producing it commercially you have five ten churns and you have ten ton churns with an electric uh, and magnetic uh, agitator or something that you know rotates within that uh, drum and it blends the premix with the oil and you pack it no rocket science because most of the edible oil manufacturers are anyway adding antioxidants like tbhq bha bht so along with those antioxidants they can add premix and the oil is absolutely fortified because the drum size is defined and what we do is we require the premix suppliers to give the premix in bottles 
which correspond to the levels that are there in the drum uh, in which the uh, oil is present so it is so 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 easy to do and everyone can do it only thing that is required is the will to do secondly another uh, precaution that we have to take is that oil should be packed in opaque and not transparent packs because vitamin a gets oxidized by sunlight if it is exposed to but the problem is that people want to look at the color of the oil so all what we can do is uh, maybe a very small uh, you know transparent uh, window in the entire packaging and the rest should be opaque if those uh, precautions are taken oil fortification is a cakewalk so we and i am sure if uh, uh, vivek would want to add something i'll be very grateful vivek would you like to no, add you have extensively i think you've extensively uh, covered uh, the oil fortification if there are any specific uh, questions or queries i can definitely answer them. so i know there you, are any ma'am please let us know yeah thank you so much for covering the topic so beautifully and explaining why oil fortification is so necessary and so easy to do and implement uh, so uh, as you said that but vitamin a uh, is affected by sunlight so there is a question that is there any issue with fortified food while cooking like uh, is there any specific advice that has to be taken care of while we deal with fortified food and cook it fortification with micronutrients is absolutely safe because food is always cooked so the precaution is already inbuilt and there is no almost no loss of added vitamins and minerals to the staple foods uh, when they are cooked so there is very minimal loss and that loss is covered by the overages that are anyway present in the uh, premix but with oil we are not just using it we are not just using oil to we are not just using oil for uh, uh, fortification uh, sorry for frying we are also using oil for cooking so if we are adding oil for cooking no loss is there but if we are adding oil if we, if we are adding uh, if we are using oil for uh, uh, frying then there is a little bit of loss of vitamin a and d when the oil is uh, heated to a frying temperature in the first frying there is all there is just about 5 to 7% loss in the second frying the loss is about 20% uh, uh, sorry 15% and by the third frying it is just about 20 to 25% loss and after that oil is not fit for consumption so uh, an oil which has already been used for frying three times should be discarded and uh, fssai has a very brilliant uh, program of ruko which is reusing of uh, oil for commercial purposes and they are uh, manufacturing uh, biodiesel with the uh, you know multi uh, with the fried oil so you can sell the the industry the food industry or the uh you know uh, mithai shop walas they can sell their uh, oil to the you know requisite uh, industry partners on the fssai website for uh, repurposing of this cooking oil so once the uh, cooking oil is repurposed it gets used for biodiesel and the loss up to third frying is just about 25% but when we are adding overages in oil we are usually adding overages of about 20% and that takes care of the losses during cooking and frying and hence it is very 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 safe there is no fear of poor quality or any harm coming to our body when fortifications are used Uh, for fortification of staples or when the staples fortified staples are cooked and consumed so i hope i have been able to answer that that fortified you is the safest thing 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, can we take one more question? Sure. Uh, ma'am, uh, one of our uh, uh, attendees have asked that uh, in milk fortification, why only vegetarian source of micronutrient premix is used and not the animal source of premix is used? I'm sure Vivek is uh, itching to answer that question. So over to you, Vivek. See, uh, if you uh, look at milk, uh, milk itself is, you know, uh, the controversial and you you can always say that it is an animal source of protein and but uh, when when we fast milk is something which is allowed and considered a sacred uh, uh, food as far as the uh, hinduism is concerned so uh, milk, milk of course is an animal uh, uh, source of protein but uh, because of our uh, cultural reasons uh, milk is identified as something which is vegetarian. And uh, when we look at any uh, source, either it be oil or milk, both, uh, whatever is added is again uh, a vegetarian source. Uh, and uh, because of the ethical considerations, we would, when, if it is available, so uh, as vegetarian sources are available, it is uh, mentioned that uh, they are allowed to be used. Uh, although, you know, the, as far as vitamins are concerned, if you are taking pills, it has a different uh, non-vegetarian logo if there is vitamin D free. So it's particularly with vitamin D, not with vitamin A, there is any issue. But uh, with D in milk, it is only D2 that is allowed and not D3. Uh, I also want to add that even in oil it is only the vegetarian uh, source of vitamin d that is added because we are putting that green dot on milk and oil and if we are putting that green dot on milk and oil we don't add anything coming from the non-vegetarian source secondly even though people who are pure 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 vegetarian they consume milk and if we add something which is coming from the animal source, I think we would be, you know, hurting their sentiments. And why, why should we not comply to those sentiments? Because we have enough supply of vitamin D too. So if we are able to uh, easily procure and provide vitamin D too, which is equally effective as vitamin d3 then let's respect the sentiments and the uh, you know will of people because and also the regulatory guidelines because we are putting the green dot so green dot means vegetarian and we should not be adding anything in that commodity which comes from the animal source Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for answering that question very well. I would now uh, like to invite uh, Nirupma, ma'am, for the vote of thanks. I think we have concluded the session for today. Nirupma, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, I, on behalf of Presser Cham, I thank all the panelists, all the guest speakers, especially from the northeastern regions, for joining us. As this webinar is ending, I would like to thank Ms. Inoshi Sharma, ma'am, Dr. Divan Shiyadav, Mr. Tapan Kumar Das, and also Mr. Vikram Kelkar for partnering us for this next year also. And we, uh, we promise to bring some new series in physical as well, as the uh, situation is turning uh, better. So uh, talking and uh, taking the opportunity, I would also like to uh, thank entire panelists, including Ms. Sharika Yunus, Mr. Vivek Arora, Ms. Dur Mr. Durga Prasad and Ms. Megha Manke for today's discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. We, we assure you that we'll be bringing some new good series on the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Azuki. Thank you. Thank you.